Hello, this is Rotten Willie, and just to be clear, I didn't come up with this crap. They are the ravings of one Dr. Posthumus Nuncius, a low-down, good-for-nothing iconoclast from some no-name planet in the backwater arm of an uncharted galaxy. He was too stupid to realize he was never going to get published unless he was a Cardushian or whatnot. They said he had no platform, so he built one, but it fell in on him. Dumbass. But don't go saying I had anything to do with it, because you can't prove anything. Though I do think he owes me funeral expenses for digging that big hole in the woods. Besides, I could really use the beer money. So you can either buy something from the following sponsors, or I'll piss in your toilet tank so that when you flush, more pee comes out. Cat won't heal? Transport your kitty safely and securely with Tabby Tote, the revolutionary cat carrying system trusted by pet lovers everywhere. Now with less internal bleeding. Kids won't stop hitting themselves? Why not let them beat themselves silly? Then treat them to hours of fun burning down in chilies. It's every child's dream. Finally, there's a product that can make your troubles disappear. Just write all of your problems on it and toss it into the sea. It's that easy. In case you're wondering why anyone would want to advertise on a rant about advertising, this could be an instructional video about cooking babies. The ad hole doesn't care about content. How many people are watching? That's all that matters. Before we begin, I should probably read this gay little disclaimer of his. Apparently, there was a dude called Jonathan Swift who said satire is like a mirror you can't see your own face in. So don't get your panties in a wad if I say something offensive. Because I was only kidding. But for everything you find funny, know that I am being completely serious. Okay, let's get this over with. Ad Holes, The Unsolicited History of Advertising. Chapter 1. Rags to Bitches. In the beginning, all was peaceful and harmonious. Then God said, Let there be ad holes. And he was like, Oh my me, what have I done? Well, that pretty much sums it up. Thanks for watching. Allow me to thank the Academy. My agent Cujo couldn't have done it without you. And whoever is leaving me those delicious snack cakes at the gas station every morning. Damn, I guess there's more. For real, it all started when a practitioner of the oldest profession was having problems distinguishing herself from the more scrupulous women of her clan. Luckily, the first ad hole would come along to save the day. He smeared berries and ochre on her face, and bam, the clientele were beating down her cave door. She would retire with a fortune in mastodon handbags and jackalope hip boots, and her pimp with more clams than he could ever spend. In ancient times, advertising was nothing to be avoided, but mostly unnecessary. Villages were small and traveling difficult. Everyone knew who sold what and where. But as populations grew, it became increasingly important for merchants and craftsmen to stand out from the crowd. Babylonian blacksmiths did so by scratching crude images of swords and shields on their walls. The Greeks and Romans used graffiti and murals to attract customers, or employed town criers to shout their praises. Plumbing here! Plumbing! Yes, citizens, plumbing! It's the latest invention to hit Rome! It moves water from one place to another! It's astounding! It's amazing! Get on the bandwagon! Pipe the shit right out of your house! By the Middle Ages, they were hanging plaques, signs, or sculptures outside of their shops. Some veritable works of art. Others simply call themselves by what they did. Whether you're a baker, carpenter, cooper, or a lopper, the profession your surname invokes is likely in your blood. Soon after the invention of movable type in the 15th century, business cards, then known as trade cards, began to circulate. At first, they were rather plain and all text, but later included printed images. The earliest newspapers had little advertising, and what they did have were little more than classified ads. Here you can buy the Beth Seeds Foodable for the West Indies. Whoever printed that one may have been retarded. Great Britain, known as a nation of shopkeepers, was exhibiting remarkable salesmanship by the 17th century. Their campaign touting the wonders of the New World incited a great fervor for immigration among its people. This wasn't the first time someone lied to promote their latest real estate venture. Eric the Red told of a vast Greenland of milk and honey west of Iceland. Bastard. His son, Leif Erikson, who didn't fall far from the tree, claimed there was a subtropical land even further west where grapes grew wild for the picking. Damn it! 
makes one wonder if we who had descended from these people tricked into colonizing North America don't have a genetic predisposition to advertising. In the 18th century, most Americans were dirt farmers and almost entirely self-sufficient. They didn't earn a living, they made one, and money played a minor role in their lives. For those fortunate enough to eke out a surplus, they might trade it for other locally grown food or for vital commodities such as sugar, salt, and tea. But as people began flocking to the cities for factory work, growers came under pressure to boost their yields in order to feed them, who in turn manufactured the implements the farmer never knew he needed until he saw them advertised in Ben Franklin's Poor Richard's Almanac. Whether you're a producer of diapers, seafood, or overrated formulaic dreck, you will need a way to promote and deliver the fruits of your labor. Problem was, transportation and communication were difficult, if not impossible in those days, especially in rural areas. This gave shop owners the power to set price, quality, and schedule by which goods were sold, not only irritating consumers, but their suppliers as well, so as to distinguish their stuff from the anonymous sacks and barrels of the same shit in every general store. You notice that your shit is stuff and their stuff is shit? Manufacturers took advantage of newfangled packaging methods to break up bulk commodities for individual sale. And once customers began demanding them by name, Well, I don't want pop, goddammit! I'm a Dapper Dan man! Branding was here to stay. On the backs of a rapidly expanding network of railroads, it became possible to ship products to every corner of the country. And with the new penny press, which derived its revenue almost exclusively from advertising, they could be pitched to the masses in high-fidelity color illustrations. One of the first successful national advertising campaigns was launched by Procter & Gamble for Ivory Soap. Their motto was 99.4% pure, so pure it floats. Despite the fact that shit also floats and is 100% crap, the slogan drove many smaller soap manufacturers out of business, demonstrating the destructive power of words, even if they made little sense. This was advertising's contribution to the Gilded Age, when megacorporations, unfettered by regulation, were free to crush or absorb their rivals. After cornering the market, they could set prices and treat their employees however they pleased. This resulted in a proliferation of labor unions. Hey, this guy's a commie! Whoa, whoa, settle down. All I'm saying is that organized labor was a reaction to an already broken system. Put it this way, if there were only one brand of toothpaste, you'd have to pay whatever it cost or let your teeth rot out of your head. So if there is only one employer for your profession, you can either be happy with what you got or go find another line of work. To be fair, the same can be said for unions today. For why should a business in a healthy economy not be allowed to hire anyone they want and pay them whatever the market will bear? The workers then had not the rights and protections they do today. There was no such thing as unemployment insurance, disability, or federal safety standards. If you cut off your arm at a meat packing plant, Tis but a scratch! So long, you're of no use anymore. If you don't want to work 19 hours in the coal mine, we'll get a 12-year-old to do it for pennies on the dollar. Come and treat it to our country! Hey now, don't make me get up! Damn kid. At any rate, the strikers' demands for better pay, conditions, and hours led to much violence on both sides of the picket line. On May 4, 1886, a bomb exploded in Chicago, killing 11 of the hundreds gathered in support of an eight-hour workday. And the Pullman strike of 1894 resulted in 30 deaths and $80 million in property damage. The progressive movement rising in opposition to the robber barons would find an unlikely champion in the White House. Breaking with the secession of presidents who had bent over backwards to cater to monopolies, Theodore Roosevelt was instrumental in busting them up, thereby saving capitalism from devouring itself. And that's a good thing. We all want choices. But is it possible to have too many? Karl Marx predicted capitalism would morph into society's reason for being. Connie! Shut up! You want some of this? Didn't think so. Where was I? Oh yeah. For some of us, consumption has become the means to an end, attempting to fill that hollow place inside with an endless array of gadgets and baubles. You may be elated with your new car, but as the weeks pass, your joy will fade. Years later, you're broke down on the side of the road, cursing all cars everywhere. 
how long before you're leaving the dealership again with a smile on your face? Like a drug, fleeting satisfaction drives us on, seeking happiness in that next purchase, yet it remains forever out of reach. For the rest of us, the cornucopia of new products vying for our attention has only fueled greater cynicism and retreat. Marketers claim to have invented the modern world. They say the edifice of civilization would crumble without their services. And that may be true, but at what cost does materialism grease the wheels of society? In The Gods Must Be Crazy, a pilot flying over the Kalahari threw out his Coke bottle. The bushman who witnessed this miraculous jewel fall from the sky took it back to his tribe, and they would soon find many uses for it, from making music to art to mashing their food. But it became so coveted, they began to fight over it. And when someone got hurt, the elders concluded the gods were crazy to send it to them in the first place. But the discord caused by a lone conveyance of sugar water is dwarfed by the trillions of bottles in the world we inhabit, where ad holes are attempting to invade every aspect of our lives. They're all over your TV, radio, newspapers, and magazines. Trademarks are plastered on shirts, caps, shoes, bumpers, buses, billboards, banners, buttons, blimps, balloons, posts, and sandwich boards. They're in the sky, window displays, neon, pop-ups, pamphlets, and jingles. On 877 Cars for Kids. They call you up, knock on your door, stuff your mailbox, stick to your windshield, and delay your movie. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Their names are stamped, embossed, painted, glued, riveted, etched, molded, burned, and stitched on everything in sight. Scream and cry all you want, one way or another, sooner or later, they will brand you. But don't try to fight back because they are very proud of their names and can be quite defensive when it comes to them. Here, check this out. I am stuck on being a apprentice, being a stuck on me. For starters, what the hell is wrong with that boy in the background? Does he need medical attention? Okay, now listen again to how she says brand. I am stuck on being a apprentice. Kind of awkward the way they tack that word on there, huh? The reason is because Band-Aid has become a generic term for an adhesive bandage, and they don't want you to forget it. Companies like them cry foul when their products become household words. If they had their way, we would be forced to capitalize chapstick, styrofoam, thermos, Kleenex, cellophane, popsicle, Q-tip, dumpster, crockpot, and Velcro. But why do brand names deserve a capital letter in the first place? They even want to tell us how to talk. In 2004, McDonald's threatened to sue Webster's for publishing the definition of McJob, a low-paying occupation requiring little skill and providing little opportunity for advancement. I work at Burger King, making paper whoppers, I would pay bad. McDonald's backed off, but the fact that they were considering it should be disturbing enough. Perhaps an Irish should sue them for turning their surname into a de facto signifier for cheap and worthless. So the next time you're driving through McDonald's, don't forget to order a McWhopper with cheese. And when you pop into Taco Bell for a Coke and they say, well, Pepsi do, tell them no. See where that gets you. Ask every employee at Six Flags where Space Mountain is. They'll probably say at a better park. And while you're screaming at a Canon rep over the phone to come fix your damn copier, be sure to use the word Xerox as many times as you can. It's the least we can do. Well, that's all for now. There's a lot more of this baloney, and he's got a novel as well, which I may eventually get around to translating. But my buzz is wearing off, and I've got a parade of homes tour coming through here in 20 minutes. So I should probably take care of that thing spawning in the bathroom before it kills again. Oh, and I guess I'm supposed to tell you to click on a button or subscribe to something or other, whatever.